Good afternoon uh, and welcome to this afternoon session at Inform Cities. In the next hour, we're going to discover how we need to use data, how we need to use data to integrate mobility, how we travel, with how we power our travel in the future through, through new energy sources. And this is one of the key themes uh, in the Inform Cities conference this year. Knowing what we're talking about is going to be extremely important in designing and adapting our cities of the future. Although it's about data, don't talk, turn off. We're going to try and make it as interesting as possible. Um, data gets discussed in both the technical sense and in the philosophical. So um, it spans the world of software development and coding and how data gets used in the city halls and chambers of our local governments and national governments. If you use Google, and this is a plug for one of our speakers to come, uh, you'll find a variety of quotes and memes um, but are they all true? Um, we'll find out how to make this uh, data a source for positive change. Um, it's not my job to give you the answer today. Uh, we've got a number of fabulous speakers that we'll call upon um, from California, Italy, Germany, uh, and yes, even somebody from Brussels. Um, so I want to turn to our first speaker, um, Oli Ginnan, uh, Guinan, sorry, Oli. Uh, for, from Google, who's joining us at a very uh, early hour in, in California. So thank you very much for that. Um, you're leading a, a team of uh, software designers and engineers at Google. And um, at ICLEI, we, we've been working on this Green Charge project for the past three years. And we've been looking at how we integrate transport and energy data to together. And I know at the, the Environmental Insights Explorer project that you're working on, this is also a, a shared activity for you. So I wonder if you can just give us, uh, for people who haven't heard of the Environmental in Insights Explorer before, if you could just spend a few minutes telling the audience uh, about the work that you're doing and how it might relate to the work that we're doing in Green Charge. Sure thing, sure thing. Uh, thank you, Reggie. Thank you uh, very much for having me. I'm, I'm really excited to be here at uh, this important event today and glad that uh, um, I could be there at least, uh, at least virtually. Um, so uh, as, as Reggie said, Google, uh, at Google, we have, uh, I'm lead engineering, the engineering team for the Environmental Insights Explorer project. Um, this uh, uh, project um, really, uh, over the last couple of years, Google created several data sets to help cities understand and reduce their carbon footprint. Uh, we created a web-based tool to let uh, users explore and understand those data sets. That tool is called the Environmental Insights Explorer. Uh, you can find it at insights.sustainability.google, and uh, I think there's going to be a, a link in the chat in a little bit as well. Um, the data and tool is free to use, and um, are part of Google's commitment to help uh, cities reduce their carbon footprint by one gigaton globally by 2030. Um, that's about the same as the emissions from uh, Japan today. Um, so, um, quite a, a significant commitment and uh, backed by our, our CEO, Sundar Pichai, at uh, some recent sustainability events. Uh, the key data sets that we produce are uh, rooftop solar potential, building emissions, and uh, I think most relevant for today, uh, transportation data, transportation uh, inventory. So, uh, this transportation data is a bottoms up model of uh, transport in a city created using the same data that people are familiar with from Google Maps. Um, the Google Maps transit layers and, and uh, traffic layers and so on. Um, so we do the work to anonymize this data and model it into city scale measurements of actual activity uh, in a way that's compliant with the GPC protocols. Uh, so it's basically ready for you know, copy and paste into uh, the reporting tools and so on that cities use to, to report their carbon inventory. Uh, we produce this data on a pretty fast timeline. Uh, in 2021, we gave our users transport data uh, for 2020 by mid mid April, uh, just four months after the end of the year, and that included a lot of the impacts of COVID, and um, that cities could really see and measure uh, in great detail um, just four months uh, after the close of the year, and they could compare to other cities and so on. Uh, so, with this approach, um, we want to move beyond inventory data alone and start tracking the non-carbon producing modes as well. Uh, so, in our data set, you'll see uh, walking, biking, and so on broken out as modes alongside. Um, car, bus, uh, ferry, and, and the uh, more traditional modes. Um, so we like this approach a lot because um, I think a particularly interesting uh, city, one of the, the GreenLink um, um, uh, prototype, uh, uh, pilot cities was Barcelona. Uh, it's a really good example of a city where traditional methods make it really difficult to get a really accurate view of the uh, carbon footprint uh, due to transport. 
it's a tourist city, so a lot of folks are just showing up for a few months a year. Uh, it's also a regional economic hub. Uh, both of those things make it di difficult to use fuel sales or traffic surveys or surveys of citizens, so the traditional methods uh, to capture the carbon footprint of the city. This bottoms up model um, uh, based on, on user activity makes it much easier to, to track this data. And because we use this bottom up model, uh, model, we also make it much easier. We're using a consistent way to measure everywhere. So it's much easier to compare you know, Barcelona to Paris to Madrid to Nice. Um, and see which methods or which projects have had an impact in, in one location that might actually map on easily to another location. Uh, something that's a, a real challenge with, with some of the traditional methods where you have to understand all of the modeling assumptions before you can do some comparisons. Uh, so a lot of cities around the world have used this uh, environmental insights data to report their own carbon inventory, uh, set targets and track the um, carbon footprint uh, reduction of projects that they've already invested in. We're hoping that this more consistent, easier to understand data that's produced on a faster timeline uh, will allow citizens, citizens to become much more engaged uh, directly in uh, some of the actions that are happening at city scale. Uh, we hope that it makes project financing become easier and accelerates the uh, transition to sustainable cities. Perfect. I hope Thank that you covers very much. Uh, some of the points, Raji. Yeah, we've, we've, we'll return to some questions uh, a little bit later, but it sounds quite as if you've got quite a lot of on your hands at the moment, you've got the two different agendas of kind of transport planning and, and climate monitoring and reporting on one side. And then you've got the working with cities and the kind of engagement with citizens and, uh, you know, reuse of uh, the data that you um, have as an organization in a, in, a, in a way that benefits everybody. So um, I think the Environmental Insights Explorer, if you haven't heard of it already, will be probably be something that we, we hear about much more as a, as a term in the future. So thanks very much for that, Oli, for the time being. Um, I'd now like to find out if Benjamino has, has joined us on the line and, and swap over to him. That's fantastic, he has. So we'll just change speakers. Hello, Benjamino. Um, I'll just give you a, a, a brief introduction. You're a very active-minded professor and renowned computer scientist from Italy. So looking forward to the flair that you can uh, bring to this presentation. Um, we've worked on Green Charge for three years now, and uh, I know you work on a number of projects and mobility isn't featured in all of them, but it's a very strong component of, of Green Charge. So I just wanted you to explain to us how, when you've been dealing with mobility data, how you've approached it and some of the challenges that you might have experienced over the years. So we've heard from Google on the bigger perspective, um, but we have many more data points, don't we, than just modal split and CO2. So just spend a few minutes giving your reflection of how you've uh, approached this topic. So can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you for the presentation. Just to say that I work at the University of Campania that is uh, in Naples, uh, in Italy. Uh, we have uh, huge mobility problems in Naples, by the way. So, <laughs> it's, uh, um, uh, you know that uh, in Green Charge, perhaps also the general audience know a bit about the Green Charge, but anyway, since the title uh, uh, it has uh, many uh, objectives, important objectives, and many aims. One of them is uh, to optimize the recharge of electrical vehicle with the renewable energy, and uh, specifically with the energy produced in uh, microgrids, so local energy uh, from uh, photovoltaic panels, windmill, and so on. So we had uh, this uh, challenge to uh, monitor and learn the behavior of people uh, with respect to their usage of electrical cars from uh, their uh, charging profiles, their behavior in uh, using uh, cars, so mobility uh, uh, at work and so on, in order to optimize such uh, recharge. Also, we have another challenge on um, optimizing the recharge of fleets of the vehicles and optimizing also the, the usage of batteries in uh, motorbikes. Or, uh, we have a very uh, nice use cases where mobility plays a big role. So we had to learn uh, mobility uh, behavior and the profile from people and also energy behavior from people. We also monitor the consumption and production, so the consumption of energy, uh, specifically renewable energy uh, from neighborhood in order to optimize 
the, the, the recharge of electrical vehicles and the use, uh, the, the surplus usage of uh, energy that is uh, produced by neighborhoods. So we had this, uh, this challenge of uh, adding to monitor um, and data, uh, that is a data, um, a lot of data uh, to optimize, uh, to simulate uh, the, the behavior, to learn uh, behavior, to predict, to predict the behavior of uh, people uh, using uh, electrical vehicles, using uh, appliances uh, at home, dishwasher, washing machines, and so on, and also the, the production of energy. And much of this data is uh, sensitive, is uh, privacy sensitive. So we had, uh, and we are uh, kind of expert in that, we, we applied uh, edge computing. So computing uh, uh, near uh, where the data are produced, such that uh, all our uh, uh, anal analytics on the data are uh, performed uh, in the household. So they don't leave the house of the person. And uh, of course, what is needed is, uh, is uh, anonymized. So th this is the concept of uh, cloud edge uh, computing. So this is a privacy preserving computational model. And this is very interesting because in, uh, in these uh, uh, analytics, in these learning uh, profiles, learning behavior of people, uh, we need to preserve uh, privacy. Uh, technology exists. Uh, we need to 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 use and to be uh, preserve privacy by design. And uh, I I think that uh, among uh, the the results, uh, the many results of the Green Charge project, and uh, the results in terms of uh, optimization of energy, optimization of mobility, also these. Uh, privacy preserving uh, technological results is uh, non negligible. Perfect. Well, that's a, that's a great introduction. Please do use the chat to, to post any uh, questions, talk between yourselves, and hopefully we'll have a chance to bring one of the questions back to the panel uh, after we've heard from everyone. So thank you very much for that, Benjamino. Um, do stay on the line because we'll be coming back to you in due course. Um, and I'd like to bring on uh, Michael Glotz, Rector from Bremen, if um, he's available. Hello, Michael. Um, yes, hello, so, Reggie. Yeah, so Michael, you're our, I'm going to call you our sage on the stage. So um, you're a motivated project manager for sustainable transport uh, in a city, in a city government. And all of this, what we've been talking about, is really meaningless unless it's actually used by people like you for the purposes of making uh, positive decisions, working with citizens and working in this politics of persuasion. So um, I wondered if you could tell us in a similar way as we've heard from the other speakers, how, 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 do, you, how do you use data? What significance does it ha have? And how do you generally approach um, making radical change in your city? Yeah, well, um, data is and always has been uh, a prerequisite for decision making and transport. Um, uh, as long as I'm uh, working in that area, and that's for a number of decades now, data is is of course uh, of course crucial. But to say it also clearly, it's not replacing decision making, and that's sometimes mixed up. Um, we um, not only in in Bremen. Bremen is a cycling city. We are uh, com comparatively well off um, with our mobility system. But still, we have too many cars, too big cars. We have a problem um, of, of, of space. And we have to deal with that. And that requires a lot of decision making. Data is necessary, no doubt. But digitalization will not solve the parking problem, for instance. Um, it requires much more. and. Um, we, as people in the administration and also in the political arena, we have to see how to interpret uh, the data and um, take the right conclusions. Sometimes you have two sources of data and you see the messages are different. And then you have to dive into to really understand. And uh, there are famous quotes about statistics and uh, how they sometimes um, are, have a special purpose. So uh, in the political decision-making, we really have to learn how to read the data. And it's nevertheless 
due to us to make the right decisions and sometimes also uh, tough decisions. And um, this is not always following a, let's say, popular trend. Sometimes we have to be a little bit harsh, a little bit tough um, in order to um, tackle the, the challenges of the future. Thank you. And then data can be used by both sides, can't it? So it can be used to kind of justify a progressive change. But I think yep. you have to be armed against people that have data to justify their, yep. the other side of the argument. Yeah, I think it's, it's really crucial to understand that data in itself is not solving the problem. It's just a tool. And, and in some cases, we have also to see it's a business case and to uh, understand how we deal with the business partners in, 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 in uh, these cases. Thank you very much for that, Michael. So again, stay on the line because we'll, we'll bring you back shortly. Um, so I want to find out uh, a little bit more from the, from the audience about what you value in terms of um, the kind of data that we might use to judge whether mobility has been a success or not, a mobility experiment, a project, an intervention. Um, do we focus or spread our efforts on different types of data? So we've got transport and energy that we've talked about. We haven't touched so much on social data, for example. Um, so there will be a, uh, hopefully, a link coming up in your chat uh, to Mentimeter. And over the next few minutes, while we're diving back into the discussions, you'll be able to vote on that. What data do we need to support a future mobility vision? Uh, you'll hopefully be able to vote on this, and we can bring that back in and with our data sets that we have in green charge, this will give us one reference point to see um, how we make sense of maybe 50 indicators that we're working with. So um, I'd like to return to our speakers now, uh, if I can, uh, and return back to Ollie, having heard the interventions from uh, Benjamino uh, and also from Michael. So do we have Ollie back, please? Yep. Right through the wonders of outer space. Um, we'll start anyway, Ollie, because I think I can hear you. Um, so we're, we're working together with cities, aren't we? And the more you put your data out there, the more questions you're getting asked. So can you describe some of the challenges that cities are coming to you with in terms of um, their use of the Environmental Insights Explorer? Yes, yes, certainly. Uh, and and um... Yeah, I appreciated the, the point that Michael made um, uh, right at the start that um, the, you know, often there are data sources available to cities. It can be a real challenge to understand uh, why a data source created for one purpose, like traffic monitoring, could be applied to a new purpose, like carbon footprint uh, monitoring. Um, the modeling assumptions might not be appropriate. The error bars might be quite different. Um, and, um, you know, they, you know, People are doing their best to try to produce the best data that they can, but um, if it isn't for the, the purpose and, and uh, uh, focus on their needs, that, that can be a real challenge. Um, we've seen some, some real difficulties that uh, cities have had in, in things as simple as unit conversion. Um, how do I get from my vehicle miles traveled to um, uh, tons of, of carbon dioxide produced? So th these are the, the sort of right up front right up front problems that people are tackling before they even get to what was the impact of switching over to hybrid or electric buses and um, you know what, what happened when i uh, created a, a congestion zone uh, in in my downtown area um, and then one other thing that i've i found pretty interesting is uh, the balance between uh, cross boundary traffic in a city and traffic that starts and ends within a city um, i think cities traditionally have had a really hard time understanding uh, the, tr the traffic that comes and then the movement that comes uh, across the boundary into the city. Um, you know, the best you can do traditionally is, is pick that up at the, at, right at the boundary and understand um, the movement within the city bounds. Um, so, so being able to, to go beyond that and really understand, um, you, know, our, you know, we see cases where um, there's a city in, in Canada, London, Ontario, uh, that is a post-industrial city. It's now a bedroom community for Toronto. Um, but it's well over 100 miles, uh, so you know, 150 kilometers from uh, from Toronto itself. But people drive every day uh, between those cities. Uh, so providing those insights both to Toronto and um, and to London, Ontario, gives a really good case for um, making significant infrastructure investments around trains. Um, there's a lot of point-to-point -point movement between the cities. Cars don't actually make a lot of sense. 
Um, but it's the option that people have today and they're, they're, you know, they're willing to drive, they would rather take a train. Um, so being able to get, being able to move past those initial uh, data hurdles uh, and towards the actions, really understanding you know, the cities and how they're working together. Uh, you know, cities are really complex entities, uh, as it turns out. And uh, if you can see that complexity reflected in the data, I think you, you have a chance to, to start taking some, some good actions. Um, but it, it's, you know, with, with the wrong data, it's, it's too easy to get stuck with. I don't really understand what's happening here. I can't, you know, I, I can't really get to um, the, the kind of actions that I can propose for the city if, if you're responsible for, for um, transportation, for example, in the city. And if we can't do it ourselves, then the city, the, you know, the, the politicians who are the storytellers can't bring those stories to the citizens. And you lose the link then between the, the folks who um, you, you really want supporting the actions that you're taking. Um, so yeah, I, I think the data complexity, simplifying that data. I, I'm going to use a Google line here, which is uh, organizing the data. Right? If you can, uh, if you can turn this problem into a data organization problem, you've got a chance. Right? You've got a chance of being successful. Um, but you know, to to date, the, the data has been ju just disorganized and hard to work. Yeah, I don't know you're in a development pathway with this initiative as well, and you, you're not static in terms of your approaches. You're trying to adapt to the feedback that you get from cities as they use the data. Very much so, very much so. We, we don't feel like we've got the answers here. We think we have some really interesting data and that we have enough to start making making some progress. Um, you know, the sensitivities around privacy are very important. Uh, how city, cities themselves want to use this data, I think, is also really important. Um, and you know, we. We've made significant changes since I started working on this project about three years ago. Um, we've got a big commitment to go, um, you know, to to make that 2031 gigaton reduction, uh, and you know, this only works in partnership with the cities and, and and working with the cities along the way. Thank you very much. Well, that's a perfect time to bring Michael back into the conversation. In that case, so I wondered either Michael, thinking Christmas is coming up, if there's like an item of data that you would really love to have under your Christmas tree this year or if there's a kind of a, a, a different way of having data. Some of the city transport plans I've looked at are maybe monitored every 10 or 15 years, and that's how often they find out what's changing in their city. So either in terms of the subject matter or maybe the frequency, how can we improve things from your perspective? Yeah, well, uh, the frequency of, of generating uh, our own data is 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 much higher. It's it's usually every five years that we have um, a bit more. But we have now continuously delivered data from uh, mobile phones, from cars. Cars are data delivering machines uh, these days, and also social media. So we have different layers of 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 media available that's uh, already there. Um, what quite often the the data looks like, uh, at is just a physical movement what we need to understand much more is the motivation we are looking at at hardware and software but we have to understand also mindware and that's the third uh, level of um let's say the modules uh, to to make proper transport planning and mobility planning and saying that is just to give you an example we analyzed uh, our neighborhoods and found out that 26 percent of the cars were not used in three consecutive days so um, that's you can take it as a good sign for the city of bremen because a lot of people use public transport or transit as ollie says um, and and the bicycle and and, and their feet 50 percent of all journeys in in bremen as ollie said um, are uh, without carbon uh, dioxide emissions so walking and cycling and then to see okay we have too many cars so there's a huge potential to change from car ownership to mobility services and to car sharing in terms of replacing the car so there is the need that we not only look at the movements but really more um, at the motivation behind it and this is a different kind of data sometimes you can read between the lines in social media um, but asking for my wish list for christmas definitely we have to understand more and also to influence uh, the approach the mindset uh, for mobility Thanks, Michael. And just briefly, how, how are you collecting that data or how would you, you collect that data? Is it through citizen surveys or 
as you mentioned, monitoring social media. Yeah, this, but it's, this, this, yeah. this is a survey with diaries, kind of diaries, and asking, uh, making surveys about um, how many cars, how many bicycles, um, how they, uh, that the people uh, organize their daily mobility. And we can always uh, make a, a cross check uh, with the data that we generate from automated loops um, and, and other things from counting machines in public transport and so on. Okay, thank you. So if you haven't voted in the Mentimeter poll yet, do remember to do so because some of these uh, different areas of data are, are, are described and set out there. So um, thanks, Michael. I'd like to now go back to Ben Yamino if I can. Um, and I'm a bit skeptical that people still really understand what we mean when we talk about big data, for example, but probably there are going to be other things that are coming up that are going to confuse us or make life more complex. Artificial intelligence brings to mind. So I don't know, um, you know, with your foresight as a professor, what do you think is going to come up that might change the way we're talking about this subject in five years' time? I, I'm not a visionary person. <laughs> more evolutionary so uh, what uh, michael said has really um, touched me on uh, mindware so now we need to understand the mind of people right and especially mobility this is a problem because uh, and also this is related to big data every person uh, uh, thinks uh, differently and might uh, react differently to a to any action on to any measure I would uh, say that uh, I'm not a policy maker, a, a, a smart city policy maker, but I would think that a Nirvana tool, a great tool for a policy maker, would be a tool that uh, uh, simulates uh, the behavior of people with respect to an action, to a measure taken, uh, in, in order to, to really in real time to understand which are the effects of, of an action, of a measure. So tools for uh, making uh, predictions, simulation of uh, people behavior, and the people are many people. So there are techniques based on uh, multi-agent uh, interaction. You might call it artificial intelligence if you like. Uh, that uh, really based on the on the profiles on the behavior that is learned uh, from from the monitoring of the of the people uh, behavior in uh, uh, normal situation would uh, predict uh, which would be the the emerging uh, social behavior with respect to any to any novelty which might be a measure put in place by a policy maker, so the effect of, the, of a measure without uh, investing uh, yet in the measure, so having a feedback on which would be the, the impact on, uh, on the social behavior with respect to any action, mobility action or whatever other smart city action, and providing this reliably in, uh, in uh, almost real time, let's say half an hour, and uh, to try and uh, to get uh, a feedback, a simulated feedback without, uh, and, and uh, choosing the right uh, action. And uh, all of this by pre preserving privacy, I, I want to stress this aspect, because uh, uh, in order to learn uh, individual behaviors and uh, to predict and uh, to simulate uh, individual behaviors uh, in the context of a society, uh, you need to be very pervasive, so a lot of big data, but also very pervasive in, in instrumenting and in monitoring every aspect of uh, a citizen uh, life. And so this is a challenging in itself. I mean, data, as Michael said, data are not the solution. Data might create additional problems like privacy. So you should put instruments that anonymize, that um, that uh, do computation uh, uh, not in cloud but uh, uh, near the devices that the people use and uh, of course uh, artificial intelligence uh, techniques uh, multi-agent simulation techniques that uh, uh, gather the, the social behavior and uh, relate the, the the reactions with respect to a to an unforeseen action 
So you might uh, consider uh, crisis scenarios or uh, uh, evaluation of uh, policy of, uh, of policies of measures. Do, do either of you uh, want to comment on that? Do you have views on that area? I, I'm thinking this has got us into some trouble in the past, relying too much on thinking that we can predict how people will travel, and it's kind of end up be, ended up being a prophecy that we've then encouraged people to travel in a certain way, which in, is in, has in the past been proved to be fairly unsustainable choices. So, Michael, do you have any cautionary tales there? Yeah, I mean, uh, there were self-fulfilling prophecies. There were industry-driven, motor industry-driven. That's uh, uh, retrospectively a very clear thing. The shell prognosis served as a base to build uh, more roads, and we know then the circle is ongoing. Uh, and we know as well for the future, we have to turn the circle around, and it's not only the pure CO2 emissions, the whole organization of transport, which is not uh, very social uh, in terms of fair share of, of street space and fair share of access to mobility. Um, and on the other hand, we know that uh, what I mentioned, car sharing, mobility as a service requires data. This is something, um, car sharing without a mobile phone and, and all the communications behind would not work. Um, and for the future, when we look at increasing automation, is also an aspect that requires uh, proper data supply. But we have always to see what's the data good for and what's the overall perspective. Where do we head to? And uh, we have to come to get away from, from the traditional transport planning just to serve transport as transport. We have to really to see it in the societal context um, that um, we cannot continue the way that uh, we de developed in the last 60 years. And this requires a turnaround. And this is the top layer. And then we have to see how data can serve that purpose. Okay, well, I think that's a, that's a good point to end on for the time being. Again, stay with us. Um, but I really want to kind of broaden out now and address this energy agenda that we've, we've talked a lot about transport, but the energy is the flip side of this. And I'd like to bring on Claire Van der Velle from the French Union of Electricity, if I can. Hi, hi there, Claire. Um, hi. Now, you're very engaged in the uh, energy industry and you're working with uh, energy partners to advise them on key trends. And I guess you're having to think about mobility maybe much more seriously than you have done in the past as a direct fuel of the future for um, our mobility systems. So I just wondered from your perspectives, what are the kind of things you're discuss discussing with your partners? Um, and um, what are the, we're transport people. So what should we learn about what you're discussing in your sector at the moment? So uh, feel free to give us a bit more insight into your work and uh, what's occupying your agenda in this area. Yeah, thanks again for inv inviting me, Reggie, uh, and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, perhaps a little bit of context. I work for the Union of the French Electricity Industry, so we have an office uh, based in Brussels, and we provide expertise and figures to the EU institutions and while uh, at the same time analyzing what the EU institutions are proposing. And I think that that's what uh, we could discuss today, because I think that when we talk about mobility and the future of mobility and the decarbonization of transport, uh, a key thing that we should keep in mind is what is currently on, at the table at the EU level and it's going to impact mainly what is going to be done in the next years and right now. Um, so, And then obviously a second point, but I will come back to this uh, a bit later, is uh, the synergies that exist between the energy system and mobility that are uh, stronger than ever. So first point is well, what is done at the EU level currently? Well, a lot, actually, because uh, in uh, its EU climate law, the EU institution set to binding objectives of reducing by 55% uh, the GAG emissions um, by uh, 2030 and achieve climate neutrality by uh, 2050. So those are huge objectives and that impact as well mobility, obviously, and the decarbonization of transport and ask the EU to revise its whole regulatory framework with some specific text on mobility. 
uh, two that we can keep in mind, especially when we talk about charging electric vehicles, is a uh, first one that uh, is expecting uh, in December uh, that will address the energy performance of building and private charging. Here we, we see already a, a first uh, link between the two, uh, and that will be important because when we well, 90% of the charging happens at home or at work. So obviously here there's a there's a key element. And the second one that I will talk a bit uh, more about is the one that is already currently on the table and has been proposed in July by the European Commission. Uh, it uh, it uh, uh, tackles public charges and the deployment of publicly accessible charging infrastructure across Europe, mainly on the on the big highways. Uh, in this proposal, we have mandatory targets, so concrete objectives uh, based on the fleet of the member states uh, for uh, light duty vehicles and heavy duty vehicles. And this is a very positive signal uh, on the decision making and policy level. However, it it seems that it's not going to be sufficient in terms of level of ambition if we want to achieve all objectives that I mentioned previously. Uh, 26 member states out of 27 in the EU uh, already achieved this target. So here there's a, a, an element uh, that we should keep in mind when we discuss at the EU level is always ask for more ambition to really be sure that we can uh, meet the demand of the EV users on the roads. A second thing that uh, uh, I want to mention is, uh, well, in those texts, it's not uh, directly, it does not uh, really set requirements, precise requirements for charging in urban areas. However, we already see that there's some good practices in some member states that we, that we should take example on. Uh, we have a lot of discussion and I think that's a very important message that I want to send is, is the necessity to discuss with all involved actors. Public authorities, local authorities should discuss with mobility actors and energy utilities because they are the one, and that's my next point, that are going to really uh, integrate the electro, electro mobility into their grids uh, and into the energy system. So this is a key point and uh, it, it means that the energy system has a, a, a real role to play, uh, obviously. Um, first in terms of connection, because when you install a, a charging point, you need to connect it to the grids. And second, uh, their role is as well involving actors uh, in the fleet electrification. Uh, and here uh, I will be, I'm sure, uh, able to mention this, uh, but we have concrete example in France, for instance, of local projects that uh, uh, do this. And, and, and finally, to finish, uh, I, I think it was a bit uh, mentioned in some discussion with, uh, about data previously, but uh, it's the readiness of the grids uh, and, and the use of data in that, uh, in that uh, framework. Uh, one of the things that are always mentioned, well, often mentioned, is that uh, the, the capacity of the grids to cope with this uh, new power demand uh, needed when we charge an electric vehicle. Actually, figures show that we're quite ready to do so. Um, even with 70 million of electric vehicles on the road by 2030, compared to the 2 millions today, uh, we know now that uh, uh, in integrating the electromobility into the grid will only represent around 8% of total investment needed, and that's fall beyond what is actually needed anyway to, to upgrade the grids. So that's a first point. And a second point is as well that network sizing will be more and more linked to local production. And here we have obviously renewable energies. Um, and with new flexibilities, smart technologies, we know that we will be ready to, uh, to have more flexibility into the grids uh, and, and, and to, uh, um, to, to be able with this new smart charging and the, and the use of, of data to better manage the energy consumption and to be able to do loft shifting, meaning that you will be able to charge off-peak hours and, and, and to, to kind of pilot the demand uh, and, and, and stock, for instance, uh, renewable energies in the batteries of the electric vehicles. I think that was mentioned, but this is a, a key point, but I, I'm sure I will be able to come back to this later on. Okay, perfect. So you've painted another complex picture here, of, but you've woven, woven in the, the, the need for data to create this smart system. And you think there's uh, openness for the big energy companies to recognize that re this renewable kind of local smart system can play a role in the, in the national distribution as well? 
Well, uh, actually, I mean, what, what we see currently is that, for instance, when you have smart technologies such as uh, V2G, so vehicle to grid, you can have uh, solar panels uh, on, the, on the roof of your house and then have the electric vehicles. And then uh, the power goes in both direction and it can be used because obviously a particularity of renewable energies is that it's variable with intermittent uh, generation. So here the battery of the electric vehicles can play a role to kind of stock uh, this this energy and can be used to use it at the most convenient moment that uh, provide benefits in terms of tariffs as well as in terms of power management which brings stability to the grids and this is very important for the energy system okay perfect well it might come back to what michael was saying about all these cars not moving for three days they could actually still not desirable to have them there but if they're there they could actually be used for something functional so that's brilliant. Thanks for giving us that end insight, Claire. And uh, again, stay on the line because we'll bring you back in case there are any questions. But uh, in the meantime, I want to return to our Mentimeter uh, survey and uh, look at some of the results that we've had here. So we had a, a scale of uh, very unimportant to important on the other side. Uh, and we uh, don't have so many fans of economic data in the room. So this is kind of a bit of a middle ground uh, area. So this is kind of interesting judging the perceptions of our audience. There's lots of people thinking we should have more focus on en energy data. Maybe that has a link to the, we have environmental data separately here. Um, so CO2 is obviously an impact of using energy. Uh, and then a general kind of level of spread on social data. So, um, okay, well, thanks for that. That gives us a bit of an insight into what, what you're thinking out there and clearly transport, just monitoring how people travel isn't the be all and end all. But to give a bit of more richness for that, I'd invite my colleague, uh, Jasmine, who hopefully you heard of in the opening session today, who has also works for me with me at ICLEI to um, find out if we've had any good questions from the chat. Yes, we've actually uh, had a lot of questions, Reggie, okay. and some of them address uh, the sort of issue of accessibility of data. So we have a lot of private companies collecting tons of data. How do we ensure that researchers, that uh, you know, policymakers have access to that data um, and can then use it to actually move things forward? Okay, so if we can bring back our, our panel, if we can. Ollie, I'm gonna give you that difficult question uh, if I may, how you're working with cities at the moment, but if more people like Benjamino, for example, wanted to st study the data, can it be made accessible to, to, to other folk? Inform Cities is about bringing all of these disciplines that we've got together. So how are you thinking about this kind of wider demand for the data that you're collecting? Yeah, yeah, a, a great question. Um, and, and we get a, a version of this uh, um, from two different sides. Um, we get uh, folks on the city side who would like to hold the data private until they are comfortable with the data, they believe it's correct, and that they're happy to, to put it out publicly. Um, so for that reason, we created a private version of Environmental Insights Explorer that allows cities to look at the data, get comfortable with it before they, they make it available publicly. Um, about 200 cities have published the, the data publicly, and um, Many researchers have have uh, used that subset, the 200, and they, they've looked at that data and done some really interesting analysis of it. Um, there's a group from UCLA um, who have looked at the impact of uh, connectedness in cities uh, using that using that data uh, as as one of their interesting data sources. We do have a couple of other partnerships with uh, the, with research institutions. Um, with folks like Ickley uh, as well, um, where we provide a much broader data set uh, in the private space and, and to those trusted partners. Um, so we've been trying to play that balance and, and, and do that effectively, um, where uh, researchers can, can get at least a, a good sense of the data, understand uh, what's happening with it, help build some, some trust and confidence in the data also. And you know, that's important. Nobody should trust that Google got the data right. Uh, having having other folks out there that can look at it and, and say yes, this this reflects the world or does a better job of reflecting the world than, than traditional methods. Um, you know, we we, uh, uh, we have several partnerships um, where uh, we provided the data um, uh, to cities to, to to do that. The other challenge is privacy. Um, we have to work with the anonymized data. Um, uh, we can't you know give people um, the, the data below that level of of, uh, of detail. So. Um, 
that can be a challenge for folks to work with that data and and and, uh, and work with it well. But this is a it's a modern challenge, right? That if we work on data privacy, we have to be, be comfortable working with anonymous data. And was there anything else? I'm quite clean to bring in Claire if there are more any questions on the on the energy side of things. Um, not not specifically. I think uh, yeah, we we did also have some questions on, on privacy. So um, it was good that we touched upon that. Yeah. Sorry, Ben, you mean it? On the first question, I almost a provocation. I mean, data is business, and uh, public administration are solicited uh, or even forced to provide the open data, you know, open data. So perhaps uh, we might solicit or force also private company to provide open data as a public administration are uh, forced, right? This is a provocation, especially to all me. I guess we're getting international government politics and a local government uh, uh, conference, but yeah, that's something to take away. But I would like to bring in Claire as well, because you didn't participate in the earlier kind of ping pong of, of questions that, you know, we face a lot of difficulties in Green Charge, to be honest, getting the different providers to integrate these different systems together and also share data. So if we develop an app, we can then make it go through this pathway of um you know actually unlocking a car or charging a car so um is this something that the industry is working on or is do you think it's going to become ever more fragmented as we go forward well what we do uh, well what is already done in the energy system mainly well i, I talk for france uh, mainly here but is that we have smart meters for instance i think that's where we most use data as a as a, the energy sector uh, so uh, it's the distributor that uh, installs smart meter as uh, so we do have around one smart meter per uh, charging uh, station so that's quite a good figure uh, for the country. And it means that we do assess, well, we use the data to assess the power that is consumed and in what quantity uh, in, within the, the day and the week. And then uh, this data is sent to the distributor uh, in an electronic manner or to the client. And then this can be remotely controlled and better manage the demand peaks. So I think here that this is where the role of data is most important in the energy system. It's, it's how we can use it to, uh, to to, to use the power at the most efficient moment, even when the electricity is cheaper or when it is needed to ensure the stability uh, of the system. Um, so I think that's the, the main point that we have. And, and then uh, on local level, uh, the distributors are working as well with different actors, uh, uh, including uh, local authorities or uh, local uh, transport uh, organization to see where uh, they can uh, put together uh, knowledge and to, to, to make the, the connection the most, uh, uh, the most efficient. Okay, perfect. So there's a big challenge there in terms of us uh, opening up our lifestyles to other people to tell us or advise us into how we can moderate our behaviours so we use energy at the best time and, and at the best rate for us in terms of price and at the best uh, impact in terms of carbon emissions. Yeah, and with a, a lot of coordination between the different actors. I think that we live in a world of synergies and we should not think in, in silos uh, where everyone is doing uh, in its own side what he has to do. We need to put all this knowledge and data together to try to, to work out uh, the, the, in the best way possible. Okay, well, thanks for bringing that. Yeah, go ahead, Michael. Yep. Statement, uh, well, bringing it together with what, what Benjamino said that we are also talking about business and competition and that's always the, the conflicting area that um, of course uh, no one unveils the secret of its business so um, it's a nice wish but put it on the Christmas wish list. Okay perfect well this t takes us back to where we started this I morning about well, breaking down silos so <laughs> Sorry to be a bit cheesy, but it's the perfect uh, time to finish. So I'd like to really thank uh, all the panelists today and thank you for making this uh, kind of virtual setting that we've brought together work uh, for everybody. And we hope you can join us in the rest of the conference. We have another specific session on energy management in Green Charge on Thursday morning. So we would invite anyone who's specifically interested on that side to join us now. Um, but for now, I'd like to say goodbye to the panel and um, thank you very much for your contribution. And I'll say goodbye to Jasmine as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I'd like to just reflect on what we've discussed with our Green Charge coordinators. If I can invite 
Jacqueline to, to join me here on the stage. Um, so this was quite an interesting discussion, wasn't it? Because we yeah. had Benjamino and Michael from Green Charge, and then we, uh, oh, if you come a bit closer, so you're into the, that's right. Um, Benjamino and, and Michael that we've been working with on Green Charge, and then we, we haven't worked with Ollie from Google in Green Charge, but he has this product and his company has this product that brings the, the, the wider perspective. And we talked a lot about bringing citizens and infrastructure providers and operators all together. Um, so what do we do with all this information in Green Charge now? We've had this hour long event. How does it help us go forward? Yes, so, well, in Green Charge, so we collect uh, different kind of uh, data, or at least, at least we try because we have, uh, of course, a pandemic that is a, a bit, uh, 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 make it difficult for us. But what we have done is that um, we define a set of uh, measures, we call them measures, that is actually as some kind of action um, to uh, try to uh, um, change uh, behaviors of, uh, of, uh, of drivers. And uh, then we look at how does it work? What is the effect of them? So for example, uh, a typical uh, measure would be um, flexibility of charging. This means that uh, um, uh, an owner or a driver of uh, electrical vehicle uh, can be flexible to charge, can postpone the charging uh, if he does not need the car immediately. And then we look at, okay, how does it affect the energy we need to, uh, to charge those, those cars? Another kind of measure is uh, about uh, uh, sharing electrical vehicles. Then, uh, well, we have this measure and we, we hope actually that the drivers are willing to, to, uh, to, uh, to, to share. And so, uh, and we also uh, measure uh, what is the change of behavior. So we have defined a set of uh, indicators to uh, actually uh, look at the effect. Uh, we define uh, we define also algorithms to uh, to calculate them, and I think this is what we call uh, the evaluation framework in uh, Green Charge, and I think this is a framework that is uh, relevant for uh, policy makers uh, in uh, different cities. Well, we have the data that we have collected now today in Green Charge, but things are changing, evol evolving, and we want to to go on uh, collecting data in the future. So this framework, I think, is uh, very relevant uh, to, to the city, uh, to the, to the policymaker, so they can actually uh, see how different measures uh, can have effect on, uh, on, uh, on energy consumption, on CO2 uh, emission, and so on. Mm -hmm. and, and what did you think about that graph in terms of the balance of data? Do you think we have this, I don't know how many pages our document it is in Green Charge, but it covers a lot of different indicators. Do you think we have the right balance or from what people were saying about the wider role of transport, do you think electric charging data needs to fit into this broader perspective somehow? Yes, it has. we are speaking about uh, <laughs> electric mobility, so the energy is very important to, to say. But I think um, it was a bit difficult to um, interpret the data we see because we, we had some kind of a yep. big wave. Actually, it's very strange. It was a bit polarized, I think. Some people think it's very important, uh, yep. not important at all. Yep. I'm very surprised about it. I would say usually people, they, they just answer in the middle. Yep. But here we have really, yeah. Yeah, a big gap. Okay. <coughs> and um, and 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 what's what's next for Green Charge in terms of using this data? We want more cities to use it, don't we? So could, yeah. is there an integration with some longer lasting legacy that we can leave? Yeah, I think something that uh, we have done in uh, uh, Green Charge is that we have um, um, built uh, our evaluation framework on the Civitas framework. So Civitas, what, what is it? Civitas is. Um, is a program, a European program, uh, working on uh, the different uh, challenge of uh, transportation. And they have actually defined a framework with uh, this, uh, measure indicators for different aspects, but they did not have, uh, uh, they did not have uh, um, uh, measure indicators for e-mobility. So we have built upon it. And so we hope that all the people that are uh, uh, looking at that Civitas framework can also uh, uh, adopt our uh, uh, 
bill, what do you say? Add-on. Add yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd like to start to draw this session to a close, but I know, Jacqueline, you're going to be doing my role in the next session. Yes. So what are you <laughs> going to be talking about in, in 15 or 20 minutes' time? Um, we are uh, going to go uh, across Europe, across different cities in Europe. In fact, the ones we've got pictures behind uh, us. Yeah. And uh, we are going to see how they uh, deal with, um, with uh, immobility, with a challenge solution, and, uh, and uh, we are going to compare uh, what they are doing. Mm -hmm. okay, and so we are also looking at the, the European perspective. Yeah. yeah. So if it will be very interesting, I invite you to join. <laughs> I think this will be a really interesting <laughs> session because it will put a very practical application on some of the, the concepts and ideas and inputs that we've been talking about. So as I say, check the agenda um, and, and come back in 15 or 20 minutes to, to join us for the next session. But in the meantime, thank you very much.